You're listening to Lead Yourself First, an Optimal Living interview with Mike Irwin and Brian Johnson. Hi, this is Brian. Welcome back to the Optimize podcast. Today, I'm thrilled to be chatting with Mike Irwin, who is a co-author of a phenomenal book called Lead Yourself First, subtitle Inspiring Leadership Through Solitude. My wife, Alexandra, got me this book after seeing it somewhere in Brene Brown's must-read stack of some kind. She got it for me. Uh, I immediately read it. Absolutely loved it. As you know, I'm a huge fan of reducing our inputs. Um, and, and, and Mike and his co-author, Raymond Kethledge, really provided kind of a context and a language for me to articulate why I'm so committed to solitude. Um, again, it's a phenomenal book. Uh, Mike is, uh, among many things, the head of the, is it Positivity Project? That's right, Positivity Project. The Positivity Project, a nonprofit uh, that helps America's youth build better relationships by recognizing the character strengths in themselves and others. He's also um, an assistant professor at West Point, where he teaches uh, an introduction to psychology, the psychology of leadership, which I think is extraordinarily um, inspiring and cool. Mike, appreciate you uh, taking the time to be here and um, appreciate the decades of work you've put into yourself um, that led to this book. Well, thank you very much. Really excited, Ryan, to unpack some of these concepts and, and these ideas that we talked about in the book and that have so many uh, uh, applications to all of us, I think, in, in the world as, as leaders. Right on. So let's start at the top. I like to start these chats with the title, Lead Yourself First. What does that mean for you? Why did you guys decide to call the book that? So part of the backstory was back in 2010 and 11 is we were starting to come together and collaborate and think about how we wanted to work on this book. You know, a part of it was this idea and this threat of nonconformity and how do you, you know, have the courage and the clarity to know when you're supposed to go down that beaten path and when you're supposed to not conform and to take a different route. Um, and so that was like part of the initial seed of the title. But as we came together and we kept on working at it, it became clear that this idea of, of leading yourself first was, um, it just resonated with us, both of us, and then also our editors, you know, who we worked with on it as well, because it was um, the, the, the clear in message in three words, lead yourself first, um, that, hey, before you're ready to lead other people, and that's what we think about so often in leadership is how are we engaging with and building relationships with and inspiring and mentoring and guiding other people, that the first person you've got to make sure that you're leading and getting, getting right is yourself. Right on. And then that leads us to the subtitle, um, Inspiring Leadership Through Solitude. So, you know, a core theme of the book, of course, is the importance of solitude. Talk to us about that, please. Yeah. And so one of the things about solitude is that it's a word that a lot of us have heard about and, and thought a lot about, but not necessarily spent much time thinking about how to give an operational definition to it. And we define it as the psychological space where the mind is isolated from the inputs from other minds. And so we'll often talk about this, but if you're on top of Mount Rainier and you're piped into your Instagram feed or into social media or into an internet um, or an article, that's not solitude, even though you're geographically separated perhaps for miles from, from other people. And at the same time, you can be in a busy place like a coffee shop, have on your noise canceling headphones and be, re and be um, writing and be thinking. And that is solitude. And so it really is that space where you um, reduce the distractions that the mind has and you are able to you know, isolate the mind from those inputs from other minds. I love that distinction. Um, and you describe it as, and uh, Jim Collins wrote the foreword to the book, which in itself was just such a great four page, you know, synopsis of the challenge mm -hmm. of, of living in the input age. And then your um, you know, recommendations to deal with that. Talk to us about so the input age, right? Inputs, inputs, inputs. I like to kind of underline words and books that, that kind of show up thematically. Inputs was obviously a big one here. Um, talk to us about what it means to live in the input age. Yeah, so when you think about, and again, this is something we're all so familiar with in our, just the pace of our daily life right now, but once again, when you slow down and you reflect and you really think about just how different neurologically is the process for the brain today than it was 10, 15 years ago when you're talking about how do you consume information? How do you know what's going on in the world around you? How do you resolve conflict? You know, how do you exchange information with other people? There's just so much coming at us 
from a brand standpoint, from a marketing standpoint. And this idea of the input age is, is just this relentless onslaught that if you don't intentionally put up barriers and think about how you're going to make sure that you reduce the flow of that inputs, that the brain just gets overwhelmed and, and deadened with the onslaught of, of input just that it receives all day long. So um, yeah, it was a brilliant way that, you know, the gym framed it. I was very fortunate. I was able to serve essentially as his general's aide when he was the uh, class of 1951 chair for the study of leadership at West Point. And I was an, an assistant professor there at the time. And I had this opportunity to see him working up close. And, um, and I knew he's a very introverted guy. Um, and this topic resonated with him a lot. He provided a lot of mentorship to Ray and I in those early days of the book. Um, and like you said, even in that four page, succinct, powerful um, forward to the book, he did such a great job of outlining the challenges and why it's so important to engage in solitude in the world today. Right on, which leads us to what we get when we spend time in solitude. You have um, basically four big things that we get out of solitude, clarity, creativity, emotional balance, and moral courage. Can you walk us through those, please? Sure. And so maybe a bit of the backstory in terms of understanding how we arrived there. Um, so we first started talking to a lot of people and researching the book and then reading a lot of historical examples. And that really came from Jim Collins's encouragement to think about some of the greatest leaders from the past couple hundred years and read about them and see if they engaged in solitude in meaningful ways. And so really we took that two-pronged approach, interviewing contemporary leaders, asking them to reflect upon their leadership experiences over the past you know, 15, 20 years, and then reading about these more historical figures. And so what really emerged, um, you know, if you, you know, trended, if you will, was the fact that there was these four different ways that you just outlined it, it, how leaders use solitude. Um, And so just, you know, briefly kind of walking through, you know, creativity and clarity, I like to say are flip sides of the same coin. And so clarity is often achieved by thinking really hard, that really uncomfortable space when you're pushing hard and your brain hurts and you're working on that big essay or you're writing a chapter in a book or a proposal or whatever your job might require. Um, And that's the clarity that you gain through like the heavy lifting intellectually that you need to do as a leader. And then the flip side of that coin is creativity, which is very often is just giving the mind space, giving neurologically speaking, you know, the opportunity for the brain to slow down for those connections that have been, you know, uh, that have been firing all day long, to to find new synapses and to come up with new ideas and so i think the best way that you get their creative you know when it comes to creativity is by giving yourself that space and allowing it to happen naturally whereas that that clarity is much more the product of deliberate effort and hard intellectual work um and just a quick note on that you know is that i think one of the big things out there today we see in the world is um, especially the rise of the gig economy and remote work and all that i think there's a lot of um, you know, leaders out there that outsource their thinking. They outsource it to consultants. They outsource it to members of their staff. And then they literally just get the presentation and then they make their decision. And they don't actually do some of that hard analytical thinking that they need to do and that they owe the people whose lives they affect with the decision. And, you know, we profile General Eisenhower. Um, at the most extreme example, if your decision is going to affect someone's ability to be alive or dead, um, on down through their livelihood and, and are you building a successful business or does your decision cause, you know, uh, an organization to have to, to fire people or lay people off? So anyway, that's just a bit of a, a quick aside, but I think it's really important that, you know, that as leaders you not outsource too much of your thinking um, that needs to be done to allow you to arrive at good decisions. Um, and then the other three and four is, you know, let the, me actually step in there because sure, right? totally. I want to, I want to kind of shine a spotlight. Then we'll do the three and four in a moment. Um, so, cause I think it's so important to emphasize the clarity and the creativity. And even this morning, I, I'm sitting here, we're recording this, you know, as we're wrapping up 2018, I'm looking at 2019 and really seeing what are we going to do strategically to have the greatest impact. And I always start my day in what I call being creative versus reactive. So I do my deep work before I plug into any inputs. And that's just non-negotiable as part mm-hmm. of my, I call it AM1 deep work slot. Before the family gets up, I've, I'm hammering my 60, 90, two hours worth of deep work. Yep. Uh, that's easy. Uh, I've just conditioned myself to do that. Then I do my you know, family time, I hit the trail, I come back, 
And it's amazing to me to feel the seductive pull of inputs because there's so many things that I could react to in my day, you know, whether it's the, the social stuff or the mm-hmm. teamwork stuff, et cetera. And literally this morning, I, I felt this like I had to pull myself down into my chair, you know, to actually yep. think. And I was telling my wife the other day just how hard it is to truly think. Um, yep. And again, even for me, when I'm reading and writing and teaching, that requires a level of depth and thinking. But it's way easier than staring at a blank piece of paper and saying what's important and what yep. getting really, really clear on what matters. And yeah. so I just had that personal visceral experience today. And I want to stress how impactful your book was for me to get clarity on how important clarity is and what solitude yeah. does to yeah. our brain. And you guys did a great job um, on the uh, biographical stories of both the modern and the historical leaders to really bring the point home. Um, but I just want to shine a spotlight on that yeah. and emphasize it because I, I literally just had that direct experience just a few hours ago. Yeah, well, it's, it's a powerful example. And I hear that from so many different people who have you know read the book and made that a priority in, in their life about, like you said, just how important it is. And I like that analogy of having to like just kind of force yourself in the chair because it is. It's just so much um, easier to do many other things in our given day. But ultimately, um, if you're not, especially as a leader, and again, this idea even of just leading yourself first, leading your family, leading, we all wear so many different leadership paths, whether or not we realize it or not, as volunteers and in our churches and in our communities and in our jobs and in our families, there's so many different opportunities that ultimately, are you putting in that hard work to think? You know, and that's the big challenge of the book is to say you really owe that. You have the duty and the responsibility as a leader to um, to do that for the people that you lead. Yeah, I'm going to go. We're going to get to three and four, but I want to emphasize this again because you guys have a really funny line. Um, <laughs> what does it mean when you're in the whole outsourcing your thinking, you know, and and kind of as Cal Newport would say, you know, being a human router, you know, not a leader, yeah. but like just a human router, like like a rat yeah. impulsively replying to things. And what does it mean that that most quote leaders are responding to emails within minutes, if not seconds? Mm-hmm. And what are they doing during the rest of their day? And you make the point that, you know, if we're serious about our responsibilities, we won't do that. Like, we'll step back and we'll see just how pernicious that is to truly being effective. And again, you can you can get by doing that in today's world because everyone's doing it. But as Cal says, to go back to him, doing (laughs) deep work, reducing the inputs, going into solitude, leading yourself first is simultaneously more rare and more valuable. And even if you're getting by and performing uh, well, again, in quotes, what are you capable of? Because you're leaving a lot on the table when you're not embracing solitude and going deep, right? Yeah, I love that. That's yeah, that's so spot on. Just obviously, obviously I couldn't agree more, but you know, it is it is really um and it's something that you know that you talk about and, and obviously Cal New you know, you and Cal and other people who think like this and trying to challenge the way that people think on this, I think is important. And I think we're seeing a bit of a pendulum swing with a fair number of people out there. Um but I'll tell you there's still a fair number of people out there that, that don't buy it. I was actually yesterday um, I, f- I founded a nonprofit called Team Red, White, and Blue back in 2010, and it's kind of scaled across the country over the past eight years. And um, st- um, students at the Yale School of Management were doing a case study um, called The Accidental Entrepreneur on Me um, and trying to put themselves in my shoes. They, so they had a bunch of financial data, and they had a bunch of different things that they could look at and, um, and at about the three-year mark of the organization kind of give me some feedback and all that. And one of the questions was, you know, is solitude – uh, integral to being able to make, you know, really important and breakthrough life decisions. And only about half of the students there who are about 28, the average age, 27, 28 years old, um, you know, were basically agreed and said yes. So there was about half the students in the room that day that basically said no, um, really creativity and clarity is achieved primarily through interacting with and brainstorming with other people. And so I think we have a ways to go to continue to convince more people of the power of solitude. Um, Because for me, in Team Red, White, and Blue, it it played a massive role, as you read about in the book, um, in 2010 and 11, those long runs that I would go on by myself is where I gained a lot of inspiration and emotional balance and clarity to better uh, lead the organization. So anyways, just as a a side note in this story from, you know, know, a business school where they're challenging students to think about, well, how important is solitude? um, That some are there and some have quite a ways to go, I think. Yeah, that's awesome. And again, part of a longer chat, but it's it's going to be yes and. You're going to develop the ideas in, in 
partnership and in communication and collaboration, et cetera, those positive relationships, et cetera. But, but we've got to start without mm-hmm. the inputs. And then just as a, as an aside to listeners, uh, who can, you know, kind of are, uh, following along with my work, it's do it first thing in the morning. That's when your mind is freshest. That's when you have the opportunity to really, um, almost like you, you kind of reboot, right? From all the inputs from the day before, you kind of digested those over the night. You're fresh, go deep, then come out and lead others after you've led yourself first. Again, I'm, yep. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm just it. preaching to the preacher here. Yeah, no, but, it's uh, awesome though. Spot yeah. on. Um, so then we, we covered our first two of, of Solitude's big four, clarity and creativity. Um, yep. And so we talked clarity. Actually, let's talk creativity for a moment longer. So you mentioned going to Mount Rainier. And you're, you're on Mount Rainier, you're, you're by yourself, yet you're plugged in. Then you're not allowing your brain to kind of go into its default mode where it processes different things and kind of that, that subconscious or whatever you want to call it, processing occurs where a lot of creative, in, creative insights occur. And it, it makes me think of how uh, impulsively or compulsively or both people are attached to their smartphones where I go on my hike every morning. And X percent of the people are, are literally pulling out their phone in the middle of this amazing yeah. <laughs> opportunity to be alone. And boom, it's almost like I can see them blowing up that opportunity to actually have a truly creative thought because they just got another input. So let's, let's just spend another moment talking about that. Yeah. And move on. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, I mean, you just, you just hit on a, a big one that I think there's so many missed opportunities for creativity. And the hard part about it is is it's hard to be able to measure because you don't know what you didn't think of or what creative idea you didn't come up with, right? So um, a lot of times people think, oh, yeah, I've been creative, but like you said, how much more are you capable of? And my challenge to people all the time is, hey, don't listen to me. Don't take my word for it. Just actually try it and run your own personal experiment. And if you give yourself that space and that time, that 30-minute walk with the dog in the morning, that hike, that run, um, when you're out pulling weeds, sometimes even if you're just driving the car and, and, you know, and not – Um, listen to talk radio or to music or talking on the phone, just give yourself that time and see what happens and what kind of creative solutions you can come up with. And what you find is most people will circle back and say, geez, wow, yeah, that really does work. Um, And these new ideas will descend upon people's minds in those moments. And so um, it's one of the things I think people can better convince themselves if they at least give themselves a chance to practice it more intentionally and then they know when they're stuck and they need to come up with a creative breakthrough solution or a creative uh, leadership decision that, hey, going off on your own is actually the best way to prime and or come up with that decision that, that is going to be creative. I love it. And I'm, I'm so sold on it. I don't do email. I don't even use a smartphone. <laughs> I would yeah. drive in my car. I never, ever, ever listen to anything. It's just these little pockets of opportunity to to create us again, to go back to Cal, who's such a great compliment to your work to, to embrace boredom. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and you talked about Eisenhower walking and, and all these old leaders and generals, et cetera, who didn't have the right. opportunity to distract themselves. Boredom was just an inherent part of life until right. <laughs> very, very recently. Um, which again, you guys describe so well in the book. So first two clarity, creativity, let's talk about the uh, third and fourth emotional balance and moral courage. Yeah, and you know, I love the first two, but the, the, these last two, there's a reason why we kind of built the book on you know, clarity and then creativity, emotional balance, and on through moral courage. I mean, emotional balance to me was very um, personal for me when I was going through reintegration from my third deployment. So I, I, Iraq once, Afghanistan twice, and then I went to graduate school to study positive psychology and leadership at the University of Michigan. And when I was there, you know, it was not a very military state. Um, there was no active duty military bases in the entire state of Michigan. Um, and so I struggled with the reintegration and I struggled with the guilt knowing that a lot of my friends and, and colleagues were going back over to Afghanistan or Iraq or being injured, you know, in some cases being killed. And I struggled uh, emotionally with that. And so to me, um, solitude and specifically running, but also just um, finding space in my day, like you said, waking up early. I, I became a father at that time. So staying up late at night and sometimes just by the fire um, or waking up really early when, when he would wake up. Um, you know, those kinds of moments afforded me the space mentally to be able to have that self-talk. Um, and you probably heard the phrase before, you know, running is cheaper than therapy. That's uh, a saying that a lot of ultra runners will use. But, um, you know, you get out there and you, it's that space for you to kind of 
talk it out in your head and say, you know what, even though a lot of people are telling me that, hey, Mike, don't worry, you, you did your 28 months deploy, you did your piece, now your job now is to focus on your studies and move on, that no matter how many people tell you that there's only one person that can convince ourselves that, yes, you, the, um, it's, it's not my fault or I've done my piece, and it's you. You know, and you have to arrive at that on your own. And I don't see how you can arrive at that, um, you know, in the presence of, in conversations with other people. It's only something that has to be kind of tapped into your soul that you can kind of access and say, you know what, no, I've, I've done my piece. Um, and so, you know, I think a lot of the emotional balance, you know, challenge today that, that so many people feel comes from the fact that people are so plugged in and there's so many inputs and there's so much distraction and so much noise that, that our mind and our hearts don't get calm enough to be able to access that emotional balance uh, and self-control that solitude affords us. Um, and then lastly is the moral courage piece. I mean, as we you know, conclude on that, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., Pope John Paul II, and Winston Churchill, I mean, these are some of the most amazing, most inspiring leaders um, of the 20th century and how they tapped into the power of solitude in very different ways. Um, you know, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. is a big extrovert, um, you know, but, you know, late and deep into the night, um, you know, where he drew that inspiration spiritually and emotionally and mentally to be able to go forward with the mission that he knew very likely was going to cost him his life. Pope John Paul II, like trying to, you know, take down communism, um, Winston Churchill and all the criticism that he faced from so many people. Um, and so, again, that solitude, that place where you fortify your moral backbone um, that's one of the things that we learn, not just from those three powerful stories from history, but also from interviewing lots of contemporary leaders of, yes, when I had to make a really hard decision, when I had to make an unpopular decision, that the answer was not getting a bunch of people around me to pump me up and say, go on, boss, you can make that decision. It was that deep inward look, that look in times of quiet and reflection to know that the hard decision you're about to make is the right one. Um, and so I think there's a lot to be said about more the cognitive aspect of solitude in clarity and creativity, but the, the spirit, you know, the spiritual, the emotional, the soul, um, you know, that is wrapped up in emotional balance and moral courage. Is ultimately what allows us to truly lead, right? Um, exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I'd just love to hear some of your practices. Like what do you do to uh, eliminate reduce slash eliminate some of the inputs and to create your own solitude, just to give us some ideas of how we can go about structuring our lives. Yes. So I think that, um, you know, we think about this in terms of a couple of ways, one planned and targets of opportunity. So there are targets of opportunity around us all day long. Uh, and the great thing about, you know, smartphones these days is they, you know, at least the iOS 12, they can give you an audit on your time and you can see how much time you're spending two minutes here, five minutes here, three minutes there, eight minutes there. It adds up. You know, when you see at the end of the day, when you've been on your phone for hours, um, and you're like, geez, I don't remember sitting there on my phone for that long of a period of time. Um, and so there are some, you know, some of these ways to use technology that can really help us. Um, and so technology, this is not like all technology bad. No, actually, there's a lot of technology, like how I signed up to, you know, find a time to talk with you, right? You, that's a great use of technology to schedule your calls and schedule your conversations with people. Um, you know, so there's, there's a lot of great things that technology can afford us, you know, to do. Um, you know, and then I think, you know, for me personally, I, um, I love podcasts. I gain a lot from them, but, I, but I'm very limited. I limit myself to, um, you know, a handful, five or six that I listen to. Um, I, you know, make a constant practice. So when I drive places, especially to the airport, for me, it's an hour and 15 minute drive from my house to the Raleigh-Durham airport. Um, I very often just have the radio off the entire time, you know. Um, and so there's this, again, this idea of, of target opportunity and planned. And you can be very intentional about it and put it on your calendar and your schedule. And ideally, like you said, Brian, to start your day because, you know, there's a better opportunity that nothing is going to derail that time if you plan it early in the day. But there are also these, these targets of opportunity that emerge where, you know, we can find five minutes here, 10 minutes here, and sometimes that's all we need. And those little moments add up one way or the other, right? We're aggregating and compounding them. And wow, I just spent two hours on my phone. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah, that's exciting. Uh, you talk in the book about one of the big reasons why people have such a hard time planning and then finding those targets of opportunity, the fear of missing out. Talk to us about that. Yep. 
Yeah, and so this is something I talked about with Brene Brown, um, you know, who was also one of my mentors, and I had the fortune of, you know, visiting with a couple times at West Point as she was researching her books, and she was the first one who told me about FOMO. Um, I'm not sure if you've heard it now, but there's this movement afoot now for JOMO, uh, you know, the joy of missing out, <laughs> um, which is the, the counter move to, to FOMO. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, I think psychologically, we know that you know, when other people are doing lots of things and, and whether it's what they're buying or the trips they're on or where they're spending their time or whatever it might be, when you allow yourself too much input, you give yourself this psychological framework that there's all these things happening without me. Um, and, oh, by the way, those experiences that everybody else is having are so amazing. And we know what people do typically on social media is they share the highlight reel of their life or of their day. And so we're not getting an accurate look into those experiences we're getting the highlight reel you're, you're not seeing all the other stuff around it and so i think a lot of us really struggle because we look at you know social media we look at what other people are doing and we see the best aspects of that and we feel like we're missing out and that's the power of somehow is really flipping fomo into jomo and and having the fact that you know what the fact that i'm not there that i'm actually staying at home for the holidays and not having to go to a million different places or that I'm not going out on Black Friday like everybody else. Like taking joy and pride in that is is a psychological shift that I think some people are starting to make, and hopefully in the future a lot more of us will be making as well. Yeah, I love it, Jomo. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> and then one of the points I made in reflecting on your wisdom in the philosopher's note was, if you want to be afraid of missing out on something, be afraid of missing out on your ultimate potential and on truly leading yeah. and actualizing uh, what you're here to do. Um, and kind of separate the trivial from the truly meaningful um, and get afraid of that. Like have a really, really healthy yeah, fear totally. about that. And then look at those minutes that accumulate to hours, that accumulate to weeks and months and years of your life in little petty distractions that could have been used more wisely. Um, so I found the book to be a real call and challenge to that. If you're serious about your responsibilities as a human being and a leader, then you'll choose to live differently. I mean, that's end of the day, that's what it's all about, which leads us to the for me, which leads us to the um, the final idea I wanted to hear your thoughts on. You talk about um, Churchill, you mentioned in, in the moral courage section, and this, this idea that he had, you know, he was a romantic, as you said. He believed that uh, you could do great things with your life, you know, and that there was a moral imperative mm -hmm. to do so. Um, can you talk yep. to us about that? Because to me, at the end of the day, that idea of living heroically in the deepest sense of the word of having the strength for two um, and being driven by that love for uh, life and for yourself and for, for those you're, you're blessed to have in your life is what it comes down to and why I think solitude is so important. Absolutely. Well, this is, a, of all the podcast interviews I've had, that's the first time I've been asked that question. So I, I love it when I get a new one. Um, so um, I think that, you know, that concept that you just laid out, the, you know, the Churchill spouse, but, but frankly, a lot of people, who have been exceptional leaders throughout history have challenged us to do the same sort of thing. Um, it's something that has become more difficult, I think, for a lot of us in the world today due to the noise, due to the distractions, um, and due to, frankly, a lot of the trivialities that just surround us. Um, you know, when you look at the average thing on the Internet, when you look at the average television show, when you look at, you know, and as you're aware, the average American spends close to 35 hours a week watching television. Um, we spend, you know, teenagers say spending, you know, six to seven hours in front of a screen every single day. That's 60 hours, you know, 50 to 60 hours every week. Um, and you start thinking about, um, like, well, what is the actual content that you're consuming that you're bringing into your mind when you're on that Internet site or on your phone or watching that television show? And the reality is most of it's not good. You know, most of it is not challenging you to be better, to, to live heroically. Most of it is just pure entertainment. And there's a huge difference between entertainment um, and, and, and leisure, right? Leisure has meaningful purpose to restore and to rejuvenate. Um, and entertainment is, I think, primarily there to distract us from the realities of life. So, you know, I would sum it up, I really think, by saying that solitude is that place where you can have the best conversation of your life with yourself. Um, it's that, that the place you can go to consistently and especially in those big moments of life where you can really peel back um, and go deep for hours, if not days, of unplugging and stepping back and going into nature or going out you know, um, and, and doing something like a big hike or a big run. But when you do that, I think you foster the environment, you create the conditions where 
it's really hard to run and hide from the truth and the truth that you know, which is that you've got more in your tank. You've got more that you can be doing to live your life better. Um, and yes, we can be challenged by all kinds of great motivational speakers and, you know, people like you and I and, and people who have written books and done all these things. But at the end of the day, each individual has to move the needle for themselves, right? At the end of the day, only one person knows how you truly spend your time and it's you. Um, and so I think that for me, solitude is that place where it is nearly impossible to hide from the truth, um, from the fact that we can be doing things differently and better and more and live for two and be heroic and all the things you laid out. I think that's the place where if you are willing to go to that space and quiet your mind and your soul for long enough, you come to that realization of that I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I need to stop those and I need to do more of this, right? And whatever it might be, um, again, that clarity really emerges, I think, when you give yourself that space and time to think. Beautifully said. Amen. Let's do this. <laughs> uh yeah, again, we can talk about this so much longer, and I'm excited to um, talk more about how we can play together. For now, where can people, obviously, lead yourself first, find it on Amazon, wherever you buy books. Where can they find uh, and learn more about you and connect with you and your work? Yeah, so the other place is so I'm at characterleadership.center. So that's some of the work that I do on, on the leadership side of positive psychology. Um, and then the Positivity Project, posproject.org. Um, but I'm on social media, you know, so that's the thing, you know, just kind of, capping it all together is that, you know, the point of the book is not to say that you shouldn't be anywhere on social media or that, you know, that, you know, um, that, that you should not, you know, um, access the internet, right? There are absolutely some, some roles and places for that. Um, and so people can access and find me on my LinkedIn and on, you know, Twitter and, and all that. So, um, I'm very intentional with my use of the time there, as you might imagine, but, um, I've definitely found it useful to be able to connect with, um, you know, a lot of great people out there, you know, over time in a very, you know, deliberate and intentional way, you know, through characterleadership.center and through uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook, and Twitter. Fantastic. Mike, thanks again. Absolutely, Brian. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Optimize with Brian Johnson. To find out more, go to optimize.me.